load up your camping gear, your bikes, your surfboards, your uh, 1980s suction cup Garfields. Where we're going, we don't need roads. No, this is obviously not a DeLorean. This is a first generation Toyota 4Runner. And while this thing can't fly, it can traverse just about any terrain you put in front of it. This right here is the rarest and quite possibly most desirable Toyota 4Runner ever built. This is a 1986 Toyota 4Runner Turbo. No, this is not my vehicle. The owner, Serge, was kind enough to let me borrow it for a couple days. Though, after spending some time with this unique and rare 4Runner, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna keep it. Now, you might not remember that Toyota even made a Turbo 4Runner. That's because it was only produced in limited quantities for 86 and 87, and then quickly discontinued. But more on that in a bit. First, let's travel back in time to the early 80s, before the 4Runner was even a glimmer in Toyota's eye. How about a quick 4Runner history lesson? In the late 70s and early 80s, Japanese trucks started to attract a following in the US. They were rugged, and more importantly, they were reliable. Their rise in popularity came at a time when many American automobiles weren't exactly known for their reliability. Before SUVs were even known as SUVs, we had off-road capable trucks with removable tops like the Ford Bronco and the Chevy Blazer. And Toyota wanted in on this action. Before the 4Runner was the Toyota Trekker, a collaboration between Toyota and the RV manufacturer Winnebago. Starting its life off as a Toyota pickup, Winnebago converted them to include a custom fiberglass rear canopy with carpeting and seats in the rear. And Toyota decided this experiment was successful enough to build something similar on their own. Enter the first generation 4Runner, also known as the Hilux Surf in other markets. Much like the Trekker that came before it, the 4Runner clearly began its life as a Toyota truck. It was quite a bit smaller, but very similar in execution to the Bronco and Blazer, with the removable top and roll bar. It was arguably more capable and its smaller size made it easier to maneuver. And of course, that off-road ability, coupled with Toyota's reputation for reliability paved the way for increased popularity of the 4Runner over the years. Looking at the front, you immediately recognize the capabilities of this machine. A good amount of ground clearance with factory skid plates allow you to explore just about any off-road environment. And with this one, the owner went with a mild lift and much larger tires, giving it a more aggressive look and further enhancing its off-road potential. Toyota had some amazing graphics packages on their vehicles in the 80s, especially the trucks. This one right here, this is one of my absolute favorites. Also in the 80s, it seemed like turbo badges were everywhere and they were very bold about their claims. But on the 4Runner's exterior, just a small badge right here on the back. The owner also made a few other personalizations to really make it his own. The most noticeable, other than the lift, are the Hilux Surf badges on the sides. He also added a newer 4Runner roof rack and of course the obligatory suction cup Garfield, a staple of 1980s car windows. Overall, this 4Runner is in fantastic shape. It was repainted back in the 90s, but still looks great. Even this front grille looks brand new. All right, let's step inside this thing. Back in 1985, John Davis from MotorWeek said this about the 4Runner SR5's interior. Luxury abounds everywhere. You might wonder, on what planet is this interior luxurious? But remember, back in the mid 80s, things like power windows, a sunroof, and not having vinyl seats were actually considered a bit more upscale, especially for a truck. This may look Spartan by today's standards, but back in 86, this was pretty nice. MotorWeek went on to say the 4Runner SR5 was, quote, more like a high-stepping Cressida than a pickup, and that it was a bit too opulent. High class. And just in case you forgot what was under the hood, Toyota provides you with these fantastic embroidered turbo logo seats. And right in the middle here, the altimeter and inclinometer make a bold statement about this SUV's abilities. This can actually be quite useful if you're climbing some steep hills and an added bonus that it just looks awesome. The Turbo SR5 was top of the line and came with everything. 
power windows, power door locks, intermittent wiper, tilt wheel, sunroof, push button AM FM stereo with power antenna, and yep, this one still works. But this right here in front of me, this is the crown jewel of the turbo's interior. This super rad digital dashboard. Now, Toyota generally reserve these digital dashboards for the top trim cars. Things like if you got a top trim Cressida or if you got a top of the line Camry, you might get a digital dash with those. But for some reason, they gave this 4Runner Turbo a digital dashboard. The pickup truck of this generation that had a turbo didn't even get that. And the Land Cruiser didn't even get a digital dash. So it's pretty special that you got one in a 4Runner. So the owner of this particular 4Runner Turbo has made some personalizations. Some of them are purely functional like this boost gauge, but some of them are purely aesthetic and fun and take you right back to 1986. We've got a period correct car phone. No, this one doesn't work, but you could feel like you were rolling in style back in 86. Of course, if it's the 1980s, you need the club to protect your car from getting stolen. Now, back in the 80s, manufacturers often place stickers on the dashboard to let you know how to engage four wheel drive and not break your vehicle. Here's the detailed information on how to do this. So you don't even need to pop open your owner's manual. It's right here in front of you. Well, in, in front of the passenger, they can tell you how to do it. And down here, we've got a sticker that is just for this turbocharged model, reminding you to avoid sudden racing. Yes, don't do any sudden racing. Make sure that it's planned. The HVAC controls are typical Toyota from this era. Very simple, easy to use. It looks really basic, but I wish new cars would kind of revert back to something simple like this. This just works. You can do it without even looking at it. I love it. And here's the Toyota clock that was used in just about every Toyota vehicle from the 80s. But wait, what's this? A manual transmission? Talk about burying the lead. I can see some of you diehard 4Runner fanatics right now furiously searching Wikipedia. The 4Runner Turbo was only available with an automatic, right? Yep, the 4Runner Turbo only came with a factory four-speed auto. This one, it's been manual swapped, which makes this vehicle incredibly unique and a little bit more fun to drive. Okay, getting into the rear seat isn't terrible. Yeah, I mean, it's a little terrible. Yeah, it's kind of terrible. Whew. Now it's reasonably comfortable back here. You can fit two adults without much problem if these front seats aren't all the way back. And you've got this giant roll bar right behind you, which makes you feel relatively safe-ish, like you're not just in the bed of a pickup truck, which you kind of are. Having only two doors meant these weren't exactly all that practical for a family. Some of the early models didn't even have rear seats. Back then, family cars were more often sedans and wagons. A vehicle like this was more suitable for single people and couples, even though they did market them with kids stuffed back here. You've got some luxurious amenities back here, like these side storage pockets, which I guess you could probably use to store a can of soda or a drink. Got some grab handles up here for when your driver sends it a little bit too hard. You got sliding windows, and these actually slide from the front and the rear. And get this, so luxurious back here. So, so opulent. You've got heat. The rear passengers get heat. That's a big deal. No air conditioning, just heat. High and low or off. That's it. That's all you need. Now, if you look up, you can see that they tried to make this fiberglass top look as nice as they could from the interior, but there's still quite a few exposed screws. And it kind of feels like you're riding in the back of a pickup truck with a cap, which, yeah, you kind of are. Now, if you're at all claustrophobic, you might not like it back here. I mean, the windows are nice and big, but like any two-door vehicle, you're at the mercy of the front passengers to let you out of this thing. But check this out. On the passenger door, there's actually two door handles. So if you're in the back, it makes it a lot easier to open that door to get out of here. Very weird, very strange, but very useful. All right, get, get me out of here, seriously. So this particular 4Runner is missing the slider pedal that moves the seat from the rear. So unfortunately in this case, I don't have a front passenger. So in order to get out, I kind of have to reach around and try to slide this seat up from the back. This is not gonna be easy. Door handle, it's pretty great. Crack cam, I'm getting too old for this. Whew. I did it. Now, if you're not familiar with how to get into the cargo area of a first gen 4Runner, you might kind of feel around here and try to find a switch. You'd think that maybe this opens up or maybe it opens to the side, but no, you have to remember that this is based on the Toyota pickup truck. So this is sort of a tailgate. Just insert your key, turn to the right, and that will roll down the window. And when that window is all the way open, you can reach back here, first unlock it, and then there's a handle on the inside. So it's kind of cool. 
actually have a tailgate on an SUV. A lot of new SUVs don't have this. It's pretty cool. This 4Runner gives you 81 cubic feet of cargo space with the seats folded flat. The spare tire is under the bed like a pickup truck so it doesn't get in the way back here. And hard not to notice the period correct accessories that the owner has included here. A bike from 1986, a Coleman cooler from 1986, even a Wilson tennis racket from, you guessed it, 1986. Then yeah, turn the key to the left and let it shut. So what about this canopy top? What goes into removing it for a more open air experience? When I first saw these first gens when I was a kid, I wasn't even sure the tops came off because I had never seen one removed. And the reason is likely because it's kind of a pain in the ass. The top weighs about 160 pounds and you really need a couple people to remove it safely. So back in the early 80s, when Toyota first came out with the 4Runner, this class of vehicle wasn't as well recognized and well defined as it is today. Even MotorWeek said that the original 4Runner was unusual. So who is this vehicle actually for? Toyota positioned the 4Runner as a serious adventuring vehicle, highlighting its off-road capabilities. But even back then, they knew that many 4Runner customers were buying into the idea that they could traverse rough terrain. But in reality, many buyers rarely strayed from their pay commute. But there certainly was a faction of owners that actually took their forerunners off-road, and word quickly spread that these machines were quite capable at getting you to remote, unpaved locations. And as these started to get passed on to new owners, many of them, especially the early solid axle versions, were converted into serious rock-crawling machines. Make no mistake, this drives just like a pickup truck from the early 80s. And if you're not quite familiar with what that means compared to a modern SUV, just think that ride quality wasn't exactly on the list of requirements. Even on pavement, it's quite bouncy, the steering is slow and somewhat vague, and there is a lot of body roll in the turns. Which makes a lot of sense when you're off-roading, but not so much when you're just trying to commute to work. Now, none of that is a complaint. You just have to remember to reset your expectation clock all the way back to 1986. What buyers expected out of SUVs back then was quite a bit different. But what these first gen forerunners lack in road manners, they more than make up for it in off-road capability. Now the base motor for the first gen 4Runners is the 22R, one of the most reliable engines that Toyota has ever made but it certainly struggled to motivate the vehicle with any sense of urgency. The biggest complaint about the early 4Runners was that they were incredibly slow. If you didn't have the turbo in 86, the naturally aspirated 22R 2.4 liter four cylinder made a whopping 112 horsepower. Zero to 60 occurred in something like 15 seconds. I'm pretty sure I've seen glaciers move faster than a naturally aspirated first gen 4Runner. And Toyota knew that they had a power problem. Toyota actually made continuous improvements over the lifespan of the first gen. First, they introduced fuel injection, and then for 86 and 87, they slammed in this awesome turbocharged motor. By turbocharging, power increased to 135 horsepower and 173 pound-feet of torque. It doesn't seem like a lot more, but it actually makes a pretty big difference. I actually love this motor. I've owned a few Toyota trucks with the now iconic 22R motor, and I gotta say, I think all 22R should be turbocharged. This thing is lovely. I said it, it's lovely. Now on this particular 4Runner, the owner refreshed the entire top end of the motor and made some improvements over the original. It has larger injectors as well as a throttle body from a Supra, so it likely has slightly better performance over the stock equipment. You can definitely feel that boost kick in and it helps this first gen feel not quite so sluggish. But even with those mods, this car is not a rocket ship, but it certainly can get out of its own way unlike the naturally aspirated 4Runner from this generation. But turbo power in the 4Runner would be short-lived, lasting only through 86 and 87. Why did Toyota kill it off so quickly? Perhaps the turbo was always meant as a stopgap measure until Toyota could get the V6 4Runner into production. 
All right, we're back on dirt again. So let's talk about this four wheel drive system. So all first gen 4Runners came with four wheel drive, but we didn't have any fancy push button systems like you find on modern vehicles. Everything was old school. You have to stop to go from two wheel drive to four and back again. And you kids nowadays probably don't even remember manual locking hubs. Yep, you gotta get out and engage them at the wheel. No fancy push button systems like you kids have today. Yeah, it takes an extra step and you might remember some commercials from back in the 80s showing people getting all muddy because they had to get out and manually lock their hubs. That was seen as a negative. But in reality, manual locking hubs are simple and usually quite reliable. So 84 and 85 foreigners came with a solid front axle. The suspension was reworked for 86. So in this particular vehicle, we've got independent suspension. This went a long way to improve comfort and handling. And that wider track meant more space in the engine bay for this awesome turbo motor. And it paved way for the V6 that would come later. But even though these independent suspension forerunners ride slightly better than the solid axle versions, don't expect them to ride like a modern SUV. These clearly still ride like a 1980s pickup truck. So it's pretty obvious that first gen 4Runners are fantastic vehicles, especially this turbo. But back in the day, this turbo might have been defined as a failure. How is this possible? Some sources estimate that as few as 2,000 turbo 4Runners were ever built. Why were so few of these things sold? Back when this was new, this turbo SR5 was significantly more expensive than the base 4Runner. And the 4Runner was already more expensive than a lot of the competition at the time. A base 86 4Runner started at just over $11,000, and the turbo SR5 came in at over $16,000. Clearly, the turbo 4Runner was encroaching on Land Cruiser territory, and that Land Cruiser with its four doors was a lot more practical. So maybe the 4Runner turbo was a flop because it was too expensive, or maybe Maybe Toyota had only planned on building a small number of them as a stopgap measure while they developed the V6 Forerunner. Either way, that amounts to significant rarity nowadays. It's interesting that something that could have been defined as a failure back in the day has turned out to be one of the most desirable Forerunners ever made. Okay, let's say you want to buy a Forerunner Turbo. Good luck finding one. This one right behind me is probably only the second one I've ever seen in person in my life. But they do come up for sale every once in a while. Given the rarity and uniqueness of the turbo, they will command a premium over the naturally aspirated versions. In today's world of mostly soft SUVs and crossovers, spending time in an honest to goodness off-road machine, one with a turbo no less, is refreshing. Yes, you have to dial your brain back to 1986 when the idea of luxury was actually having cup holders. And no, this does not have cup holders. But this vehicle truly gives you the urge to explore the outdoors, to go where you've never gone before, to find a path that will actually be a challenge. Can a car actually push you to get outside, to enjoy wilderness, to experience nature? I think this one can, and the turbo just makes it a whole lot more fun getting there. When you absolutely need to get somewhere and you don't plan on any terrain getting in your way, pack your bags, throw your bike in the back, the surfboards on top, and just drive. And with this turbo, know that you have a strange, obscure piece of Toyota history. What do you think of this first gen 4Runner? Is the turbo worth it to you? What other 80s multi-purpose vehicles would you have considered back in 86? If you like what you've seen here today and you wanna see more videos about my fleet of obscure 80s and 90s cars and more videos about vehicles just like this 4Runner, please consider subscribing. Also, do you have a vehicle that you would like to let me film with? Please let me know. Send me an email with the year, make, model of your car and your location. Would you like to help support the show so I can make more videos like this? Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash hello road. For as little as $2 a month, you can get early access to my videos and more. Also, you can help support the show by buying a t-shirt. I've got one like this with my 74 Datsun B210 on it. I've also got a whole bunch of other rad shirts to choose from. All right, that's it for today. Thanks so much for watching. See you soon.